All right, welcome in to another pre-recorded Aftershock. The person to my right is no stranger to any of you. He is the man on the East Coast who is super busy, but he is the, the, the knowledge worker, the knowledge creator around everything having to do with the Earthquakes roster. Colin, how you doing, man? It's good to be here. Um... It's. I actually did get out to Northern California last weekend. My mom and oh, good. I have a, a shared birthday, so uh, I got I got a little bit of exposure back to the Bay. It was nice to be home, um, but I'm back here in New York. Uh, it's a little bit drizzly. It was less smoky than it was. Life's pretty good. Yeah, less smoky is, is is good. You're wearing your jacket from work. I think the white on white, you just decided to stick with what works here, right? Yeah, look, uh, I, I was wearing it anyway today. I figured to class up the show. Why not? <laughs> and as you can see, it's actually pretty cool up in the Pacific Northwest. As no, I'm well. sure. So I keep going between short sleeves and sweaters. And as soon as I get used to one, I have to switch to the other because the weather here is in a constant state of flux. Okay, well, we've got a lot to cover here. Someone recently on one of the post game shows, Alex and I were trying to do what you do. And they're like, why don't we just ask Colin about this? And I said, yes. Why don't we just ask Colin about this? But of course, you know, you're you're a busy man. I'm just uh, really excited I mean, to get started. Honestly, talk. the time zones also is just brutal with all these yeah. ups that are 730 on the West Coast. Remember, that's 1030 for me. That means the game ends at roughly <laughs> 1230. Right. And it means that the aftershock will run until at least 130 or later. So well, the last aftershock, not, last yeah. aftershock was the New York game. That, yeah. That, that you were been able to join. So yeah. it actually has been a while. We haven't. Uh, the new uh, league uh, schedule, good for some things, not good for Colin and I. No, things. it's not good for me. So uh, anyway, all right, well, let's jump into it. You've got a number of, of topics that I, I think you think are of interest. And then our patrons were kind enough to leave us a number of questions as well. So again, you hear about the patron Slack all the time. This was an opportunity where if you wanted to ask questions, we left it to some patrons. We're going to try to answer those as well. But let's just jump into it, Colin. Secondary transfer window going to be upon us soon. Um, we tried to ask some questions in today's press conference uh, with uh, Lucci Gonzalez. But, you know, as you would kind of expect, he's more like, yeah, you know, acquisitions, not really my area, more Chris Leach's area. But, yes, we are looking at some stuff. Um, we will be very careful about how we do it. We want to maintain our... Um, you know, kind of uh, ethos and and culture that we're trying to establish as we do this. But what's the wiggle room here? Because, you know, they this team, correct me if I'm wrong, they've spent the most TAM, at least they have the highest amount of TAM players in the league yep. and total, you know, TAM salary outlay. So does that mean that we are looking at less wiggle room as a result of that like what impact does it actually have here in terms of what the quakes can do in the window yeah the the two thing the two places to start with are actually the first place to start with is the the salary update that we got from the mls players union they get, they put it out twice a year it's not always precisely on a regular schedule but it typically once will happen in the spring once will happen in the fall uh and that that gave us adjusted salaries on the the guys already in the roster and it also gave us the salaries for the new entrants um and I would say that's the that's the first place to start because you, you can't do any analysis of where they're going to go without having an accurate salary picture. Um, and then beyond that, it's it's actually relatively basic stuff about what slots they have available and how they can use them. Uh, and I will I will lightly criticize the MLS website right now. They are not good at at reporting accurately which each team's rosters uh, slots are, uh, mm -hmm. even though they have a page dedicated to this. If you go to the MLS. <laughs> San Jose Earthquakes page, it says, here's the roster category they are. Here's if they're international or not, if you're, you know, DP or not, homegrown or not, or whatever. But a lot of it's inaccurate. And you know, <laughs> it, so it's, it, it can be helpful. Occasionally, we have noticed changes on that page and then texted the front office and, you know, clarify. And they, it turned out there was actually a meaningful roster change. Uh, and then there's other times where it's like, hey, Usini Buddha is still on the injured reserve. Is that true? And they're like, no, I have no idea why that's still there. <laughs> um, you know, so, uh, you know, basically this is why we at Quakes Epicenter keep the spreadsheet and me in particular, why I'm interested in the spreadsheet that I keep uh, is, you know, we know for a fact the league's 
publicly facing website uh, doesn't have all the right info. And the MLSPA sheet is actually not very searchable or usable because uh, it's a PDF. It's not even like an XLS. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Although I think ASA hosted it as an XLS on their site, maybe. Or so what we, yeah, I think like we're, we've been making some changes and my, I'm not involved with this at all, but my understanding is we found the way to like scrape the site or something like that. So we can pull it out fairly quickly and get it loaded into the site. I think it's there now. Yeah. Um, and I think you can export it to CS, uh, CSV for those of you who that's are right. so inclined. That's right. You can go to American but Software Analysis .com, The point is the interactive tables, go to salaries and download. There, the point is, good. for for the viewers of this, you're going to have to now bear with me for a few minutes uh, consecutively of me just trying to describe what I saw here. Uh, we can start with uh, with the salary stuff, and Jamin, chime in on on what you noticed from the salary update. I flagged a couple things, so you know, hop in any time. I think I, I think I said what I noticed, which is like the Quicks are very good at spending TAM, mm -hmm. and you know. While you could say like the total roster spend is low, a lot of that really doesn't have to do with the bulk of the roster. It has to do with how much of that expenditure goes toward the DP side of the roster, right? Yeah, exactly. And, you know, and that's going to be a big part of, I think, what we talk about in terms of the flexibility that they have. Yeah. So anytime you see what total team spending looks like, because uh, every time they publish the new salaries, it, you know, everybody always publishes the list of, you know, of the teams in order. Um, the, the way that you get high on that list is by paying your DPs a lot of money on salary. Um, the, excuse me, guaranteed compensation. Um, right. So that, that's how you get high on that list. That does not take into account things like transfer fees uh, and uh, other kind of off off the not off the books, but not visible mechanisms to us, uh, and it actually also doesn't include uh, incentives. So if there, if a striker has like a you know two hundred thousand dollar bonus for getting ten goals in a season, you're not going to see that in the MLSPA sheet. Um, so there are things that you don't see. Um, but it, what you're right to suggest that the Quakes have an unusually large number of TAM level players, and TAM level, by the way, just it technically means anywhere from the minimum sal or excuse me the maximum budget charge, which is a little bit over six hundred thousand dollars, all the way up to about a million dollars above that. Um, so technically, anyone in there can be bought down with TAM. Uh, there is one distinction I would make, though, which is just because you have a lot of players in the TAM zone doesn't necessarily mean you're spending all of your TAM money or that you're spending more TAM money than other teams are. So, for example, if you have a guy who's on one point five million dollars, you're allowed to buy him down all the way down to one hundred and fifty thousand of on budget charge with TAM or at least you were under the old rules that may have changed this by now without telling us. Um, so that means that that's like a big, large TAM expenditure, even though it's just one player. You can <laughs> also have, you know, five players who are all on 700,000, which is kind of like right in the sweet spot of TAM, who are only bought down 200,000 each uh, and kind of just under the threshold. So TAM allows a little bit of flexibility about how you manage uh, your roster and because it's opaque to us exactly how they've chosen to allocate their TAM, we mostly just assume, or at least I assume, uh, that that TAM budget is just more or less kind of a, a salary cap unto itself that just applies to a particular category of people. Uh, we, In terms of what we know about the team's overall spending, we know based on this release that it is significantly up on last year, but that it's still sort of in like the 25th percentile of spending in MLS. So it's still on the bottom half of spending, uh, but it is a big chunk up from last year and you're adding in more kind of TAM level players. So you would imagine that that means that they're going to be tighter against their guaranteed spending uh, than they than they were before. However, you also got a lot of GAM in the form of uh, the Marcos Lopez transaction in particular, and a little bit in the form of uh, Francisco Calvo. So it makes it really, really hard to say where they are for allocation money. Um, but uh, I'll get to that in a second. Uh, I just want to do a couple quick hitters on the salaries that we saw that were different than what we had seen before. Um, obviously, generally speaking, you get a, an across the board bump. Most players contracts have small raises built into them. So right. you see that. Uh, you see uh, Miguel Trauco's salary was reported to be 150,000 last year. We on Aftershock told you that that was a, a misnomer. It was a misleading figure. Uh, and we now see that return to about 500,000, which is kind of what we expected for a starting caliber left back, you know, a Peru international. So that's kind of one big shift from last year. Yeah, um, the 150, we, I would have to imagine it was just for his time and actually being in MLS last year. So exactly. So those guys who portion of a full season, 
contract. Yeah, the guys who join midseason or later, sometimes the way it gets reported to the union, they don't report it as like an all year amortized salary. Sometimes they right. do, by the way, which makes it confusing. Um, confusing. But yes, that, that's, you know, he, now we know that he's getting paid the way that Carlos Acapa was get, getting paid, the way that a typical starting left back might get paid in MLS rather than right. an incredibly screaming deal on getting a Peru international on a fairly low salary. Um, uh, I'd also note that Jud- uh, Judson and uh, Tommy Thompson did come back on new contracts and took big pay cuts to do it. So, you know, that means that the team is getting more value for dollars than they were before on those players. Uh, and that those players clearly really wanted to be in San Jose. Um, and then the final thing I would note is that it seems like the for the longer term contracts that the Quakes are handing out, their last year options uh, I'm particularly noticing this with Casey Walls and uh, Emi Ochoa, who are on long-term contracts, but they're still quite young, but they've been at the club for long enough. They're in that option years that those option years have significant bounces compared to their previous salary. This is also true of Benji Kukanovic. Uh, and that, that is typical of the way that these contracts are structured. So just because you have an option year doesn't mean you get to bring a guy back at the exact same salary that you had him before. A lot of times it comes with a kicker. And that's actually something that's required by law in Europe. Uh, and the CAS, the Court of Arbitration for Sports, has tried to kind of adjudicate how to use this. But basically, if there's a unilateral team option, usually there needs to be a bump. Anyway, this might be arcane, but this is just something to keep in mind for, you know, when they're making decisions about next year, that options aren't necessarily just wherever their salary is. Um, and then the next thing I want to do is just, therefore, with all that in mind, uh, with the spreadsheet filled back in and we, we have all their, our data correct, unlike the MLS website, where does that leave us in terms of, of, of roster resources? Uh, and uh, let's skip the money discussion for a second. There are all these slots that you can use one way or another. We all know about DP slots. TAM slots, actually, it's not a slot. TAM is just kind of a, an accounting designation that you get to you know, buy people down. Um, you have international slots. You have U22 slots. You have a senior roster and a reserve roster, et cetera. So by my count, they have all three DP slots filled, which has actually been a rarity in the last 10 years of Quake Soccer, um, as in currently active designated DPs. And remember, that is an accounting slot. That is not necessarily a reflection of you know, who the best player is. Of the international slots, I count six of eight currently used. Uh, there's one caveat here, which is Nathan is an international and the, the rules about in, injured lists are a little bit ambiguous about whether or not you get the, injur, uh, the international slot back. So I don't know if they do. If they did get the slot back, they're at five of eight, which gives them plenty of room to maneuver. If they don't get the slot back, they're at six of eight, which is still a, a pretty good amount of uh, space to maneuver in. So, so unless we get a clarification from Chris Leach prior to the window, which we probably won't, uh, probably best to assume it's it's six of eight to be safe. I'm going to assume it's six. The, the The injury replacement rule mostly focuses on the money and the budget charge rather than than international slots or those extraneous things. But as I said, even if they don't get the slot back, they still have at least two international slots to play with. When Usaini right. Buda got uh, his green card and they sent out Oscar Agarin on loan, that right. means that they freed up two slots. They have those free and clear. And I would be surprised actually if they got more than two internationals in this window. Uh, so, you know, and it's possible, certainly, but, you know, if it comes to that, I'm sure they'll figure it out. Uh, and then the last uh, major, or the last two things are, so the U22 slots, uh, they have one currently occupied, that's Cade Cowell. And it's a very complicated rule, but based on the rule, they actually are allowed to have two more uh, mm-hmm. than they currently have. So they can sign somebody with a U22. There are lots of caveats about who can use this program and how. Uh, but a, 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 defi- a defining case, a very simple case, would be somebody like Marcos Lopez, somebody who you buy who's under 22 years old when he enters the league, as long as the salary isn't above the maximum uh, budget threshold, a.k.a. a DP. At that point, they'd be a young designated player, and that kind of fits a different slot. So the Quakes have two U22 slots free and clear to use. They have two international slots free and clear to use. Uh, they also have four a senior slots on the senior roster out of 20 free and clear to use. That's a whole bunch of space. And you can use that in different ways. Uh, I don't like focusing on the reserve roster because it's much easier to kind of, you know, move the, you know, move the deck chairs around to kind of make it work on that side. So that the, the reserve roster is full as con- currently constituted, but if they wanted to add guys in the reserve roster, it's very easy for them to make maneuvers to make that happen. So that's not a big deal on the senior roster though. They have four, free and clear spots. So you got four senior spots, two international spots, two U22 spots, 
free and clear. The DP slots, though, I want to focus on for a second. Uh, they have three guys. They're all in the low million uh, million salaries. Those are buy downable, and it's possible. And I, based on what I believe, it is possible they have enough TAM to do that. And it's, so it's possible that they, if they found the right guy, that they could do so. Uh, so I think that even when you see something that appears to be full today, just keep in mind, you know, we don't have the full picture here. So, and there, even if we did have the full picture, there'd be a lot of ways to kind of maneuver around this roster. So if they find the guys that they like at the price point that they like, they'll find ways to get them on the roster one way or another. Um, so, and they can always trade for a little bit of extra gam or something if they need to kind of squeeze that difference um, or, or an extra international slot or whatever it be. So I'm giving you that just to suggest the roster has a lot of room on it. The DP slots are flexible and can be bought down. And there is, in my opinion, probably a decent amount of either cap space or gam or TAM collectively, because it's very hard to, when you're doing this from the outside, it's very hard to figure out exactly what portion each one of those things is. But I would wager that there's enough for them to make a, a meaningful acquisition, even without any exits. Uh, I'm not saying necessarily a world changing one, but, you know, if if one of the majors like if Lionel Messi wanted to come along, like they would they would be able to kind of make that sort of thing work. Uh, so th there is the flexibility there. It would just be that would put them right up hard up to the edge. Uh, but I think that they can do it. So real quick, if I was still sticking to KCAL a little bit more, because, of course, you know, the, the, the rumors have persisted. And of course, they had the U20 good performances. And, you know, the expectation here is there's interest in Kay Cowell. Um, sure. There has been European interest before. I believe Rhymes was interested of up to $4 million uh, transfer last season. Let's say there's another $4 million, $5 million, maybe up to $8 million deal that comes along. Um, you know, are you are you versed enough to kind of talk us through what would happen in terms of a GAM, um, you know, expended? Like, what what would the Quakes get back in GAM for a five, let's say, a five million dollar transfer into Europe, and then presumably they could immediately spend that GAM to help them be able to do an acquisition in the window. Yep. I, so I don't have the rules in front of me, so I, I actually might have the exact number wrong. But one thing to keep in mind is there is a maximum amount of GAM you can get from an external sale. So mm -hmm. it's I think it's in the order of a million dollars, maybe a touch higher than that. Uh, but it means that the difference between four, five, ten million is not material from an, uh, an allocation money perspective. It's obviously material from the club's perspective because that gives them you know more cash to operate on. It's going to make them more able and willing to spend money beyond the budget, i.e. on designated players, on the transfer fees uh, that they're using for U22s, et cetera. So it's material to the club and it does shape their long-term budget. But in terms of allocation money, I think it's only about a million. And yes, they can turn it around and spend it right away. So if they sell him, yes, they will, they will get one of their U22 slots back, which is not important at this juncture because they only have one uh, currently used out of three. They get the Char budget charge associated with that slot back, which is uh, not huge, but it's something. Uh, and then they get the million in GAM as well. So yes, it would absolutely facilitate a more and more aggressive transaction in the future. So I think that it's for them, it's not the, the difference between four and five is not about the allocation money. I think that the, the, the contingencies are, you know, are, is their asking price going to get met? And I would wager it's more in the eight to $10 million zone than it is in the $4 million zone. Um, not to say that that's necessarily the clearing price of the deal, but I would I bet it's towards that higher end uh, and whether Cade wants it because it, there are some guys like Marcos Lopez who are very clear, like my goal is to play in Europe. That's where I want to be. Um, Cade, it doesn't seem I mean, he certainly said, you know, has a goal of playing in Europe, as many young players do, but it doesn't seem like he's you know, screaming to get out of the club and go to Europe as soon as humanly possible. Because if he was, he would have pushed for the transfer last year, which, you know, he didn't necessarily. I think right. he's willing to wait for the right situation. So, you know, I think that from a pure accounting perspective, it makes a lot of sense to sell him as soon as you get a good offer. Um, but, you know, it's hard to know exactly whether the right circumstances will line up. Okay. Um, Do you have any other Cade Intel, by the way, before we move on from that? Um, you know, I, I, I don't, um, other than when we, you know, when I talked to him after the U20 World Cup and, and said, do you feel that you have performed at the level this season where, you know, 
you would be ready for a move to Europe? Because last year you asked that question or you asked that question within the club, maybe not on the record here, but when you asked that question, they were kind of like, yeah, he's not having the season where we feel like we can get maximum value to move him. And also I think Cade had some input as well into that rhyme situation from what yep. I've been told. And like neither the club nor Cade felt it was the right situation. They wanted to wait. And particularly, I think knowing the U20 World Cup was coming and that Cade would likely play in it and that he could show well in it, which he did, like they felt like it would make sense to hold off. Also worth noting, he's been called in for the Gold Cup roster. Yep. And so, you know, further exposure, you know, on the world stage, uh, you know, in this case, another international on a senior team level could drive further interest. It may not make sense to take a short term move. It may make sense to see if more value could come, you know, from the Gold Cup, because that would happen during the international window. All possible. Um, but, you know. Uh, we don't know what's coming in in terms of offers uh, as uh, Fabian Frankel reported today, you know, uh, from his sources, at least there is no firm offer on the table for Kate today. So yeah, I'm not uh, take, aware take of that for what firm you're... author either. Um, but I, I agree with Jamin that after the gold cup is probably the best time uh, for, for a transaction like that to go down. Uh, and I, as I said, my guess would be some, something more in the eight to $10 million range. And by the way, no matter what they do on a sale, it's going to include, a, a fair, I would imagine, a fairly heavy set of incentives and or sale uh, sell on clauses and the like, because that's typical of young players, because you don't know right. what you're buying. Um, for a seasoned veteran, sometimes you get a fee that is like almost entirely guaranteed. For a 19 year old uh, who's a very much an unfinished product, you know, we're going to get a bunch of different information reported if he's sold, and it's going to be kind of unclear about how much of it is guaranteed and not. But I would imagine that the club would want something like you know, in the higher single digits uh, that they would count on and then maybe a little bit of kicker on top. Do you think there's a any certain amount of, of GAM that would be important to be able to replace him with a designated player in terms of the transaction? You mentioned the million. You know, do you think like, is that million essential right now for them being able to make I a, think, a move to replace him? With I think player? they could get a DP in the door without selling him. Uh, it would stretch their sheet and you know it would be like cramming to the corners of what they could fit but i i would guess that they would be able to do so as is because for the dp remember the what you're really getting is you're getting six hundred and twelve thousand five hundred dollars on the cap uh and that's mm -hmm. the maximum budget charge so they just have to clear they have basically have to clear one dp slot and by the way uh I know, I know this is going to be weird, but the lowest salary of their three DPs right now is Christian Espinosa. And I've heard sort of conflicting information about exactly how the transfer fee is amortized uh, over the life of a contract or not, depending on the structure of a deal. Uh, it might We might be in a weird situation where Christian is the guy who gets bought down uh, just because of the way that his budget charge works. Don't freak out, guys. It's not a designation about how good he is. It's just the accounting. Uh, but basically, you need to get the, the slot free, and you need to clear enough on-cap space to fit that $612,000 uh, budget charge. I, I think they might be able to do that as is. Not 100% confident, but I think they might be able to do it as is. If they sell Cade, absolutely. No problem. I mean, you can already see the math doing uh, going there. Christian's on $1.2 million. You get a million dollars of GAM, buy him down. You're barely adding anything to the cap uh, to, to put in a new designated player if you have that much GAM. Yeah. If I had five minutes right now with Chris Leach, first question I would ask him is Rodriguez. Um, yeah. Clearly, this looks like a player that the team would like to, to retain. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but his loan is actually expiring during the season here. I, I meant to look that up before we talked today. What, uh, yeah, this is one of the patron on questions. Loan? Yeah, this is one of the patron questions we got as well. Uh, so, yes, it was a very unusually structured deal, but it reflects the fact that, you know, seasons align differently in different leagues. And Brazil has a particularly strange football calendar uh, where they have kind of like their regional state competitions in the spring. It's, it's a whole mess. But anyway, yes, it was initially a one-year loan starting last summer, which means it expires shortly, uh, I mm -hmm. believe, at the end of June. Uh, and then there was an option to extend the loan six months beyond that to the end of this MLS season. And then I believe there's a second option uh, to purchase him outright. Uh, okay. I have heard, I actually have not heard anything one way or another about 
whether or not that's going to happen. So I don't have any inside information, but I would be stunned if they did not extend him to the end of the year uh, and not quite as stunned, but still surprised if they didn't exercise the purchase option. Uh, the only reason that they might not is if the option is set at a price that isn't attractive and they can't negotiate a better price. But the loan extension part of it is a no brainer. You know, he's mid season with the club. I, I can't imagine that they let him go. From an accounting perspective, how does that work? Does his is his loan automatically assumed to take the full season, and that's the way the accounting works, or yes. would they take an additional charge in order to renew it? They would not take an additional charge. They it, it would basically they would lose the charge from here on out uh, if if he was not extended. So salaries from the beginning of the year are treated as annual, like you know you're, you're you have an annualized amount. By the end of the year, if you come in mid season, only half of it counts against the cap. Um, so, but so there, there are things that are, are strange on the back end of this, but for Rodriguez, it's not, it's, it's a simple situation. His salary, if they didn't pick up his option, it would be taking, it would be adding space. It would not be taking away space if they did. The precedence here, of course, it would be what they did with Shofis, in which they chose not to renew yeah. uh, his loan mid season, uh, last year. Okay, so coming back to you know the previous window, let's let's just talk kind of talk about what have we seen in terms of Chris Leach's windows. We now have the benefit of a bit of hindsight. I think I think it was very easy to look at the Jeremy Abobasi and immediately feel like, wow, this was a really good transaction that had a huge impact. Yep. Probably Chris Leach's statement as to why I should be the general manager of this team because he basically had the interim tag at that point. And um, and then he's had, you know, additional windows. You know, if you look at these moves he's made over the summer windows, you know, what is what he's done in previous windows potentially tell us about, you know, this this uh, upcoming window? Well, the interesting thing is last summer they did a lot of work, uh, but all of that work was with this year in mind rather than the, the year that it was in itself. And that's one of the big differences that will be unknowable is that Leach has never been in a position where they are like a serious playoff contender. Mm -hmm. um, he's been in a position of, you know, this team's terrible and rebuilding and we kind of need to look to the future. Abobasi was a long-term play, right? And that sure. was two summers ago. One summer ago, they got rid of Marcos Lopez because he was running down his contract and wanted to leave. Francisco Calvo wanted to leave, get some gam back. And on the incoming side, Rodriguez, Acapo and Trauco, particularly Acapo and Trauco, were signed exclusively with this year in mind. They were not signed with 2022 in mind. Uh, so it's going to be a different strategy because last year he basically got to use the summer to kind of put future pieces into place to kind of get a, a, an early start. This year it's different. He's going to have to potentially, you know, fix the holes in the roster to fix results on the field this year. Uh, so, and that is a slightly of a different approach. But if you looked, you know, if, one thing I, you know, I put it in our notes here is just like, how did they do? Like, meaning like, are, do we think they did a good job? Like clearly all three of those guys they signed last summer added to the club. The, the, the yeah. defense is a lot better than it was before. And all three of those guys are either starters or kind of more or less starters, depending on how you feel about Paul Murray and where he sits in the fullback rotation. You know, they have three guys who are kind of starting level fullbacks. Rodriguez is an unambiguous starter at this point. And all of those guys came in at around half a million in salary. And I believe that Acapo and Trato were free transfers and Rodriguez was on a fee that we don't know yet, but you know, it's not even paid yet because he's still on a loan. So that's good business. That's really good business that set them up well for this year. Um, the, the business from the winter, you have Carlos Croeso came in, you have Daniel came in, Beldissimo came in and uh, Mensa. And I think that those were the main incomings, mostly on the defensive side or mostly at the back end of the, uh, of the formation. Those were also Pretty dang good, uh, pretty dang good deals. I mean, that's kind of what's keeping the Quakes in fifth place at this point. Absolutely, the defense and the, and the recent goal keeping from Daniel. And they're very different transactions. You know, Grezo is a big swing. It's the most money they've ever spent on a transfer fee on a player. It was clearly a Lucci priority, uh, and he has really enabled the team to play the way that Lucci wants to play. I personally don't think he's been playing at like a superstar level, but he's the way he plays has enabled the. The, the team to kind of rise to that level. Um, Daniel was a big gamble and we talked at length on this show and on the blog about exactly what went into that decision and what would make it good or bad. Now that we've seen him healthy uh, and, you know, experience, you know, well put into the team for the last three games, you're now you see why they spent the money on him. Like that's a, that is it. He's the reason that they, 
haven't dropped points, you know, through that series. Like this is, he is a major point. They're not, they're not scoring goals and they're still averaging two points a game throughout the last four games, two of which were on the road Yeah, where they so weren't did, getting really points before. So that's a, that's Wild. a big home run of a transaction. And I was very skeptical of it because you really do need to get that level of shot stopping to kind of justify those resources, but they, he, he's playing at that level. So if he keeps it at yeah. this level, then that's a great transaction. Yeah. Real quick on that, you know, as people have maybe seen me tweet about this, but He's a career 80% shot stopper, whereas JT is a career 70% shot stopper. That's not bad. 70% is average in MLS. Yep. We go all the way back to the start of when we have data accessible to us from Opta starting in 2013. 70% is the league average, and JT is basically bang on that average. 80%, nobody calling, nobody. And that has had been a keeper for more than 20 games in this league in a season has averaged more than 80%. There are two guys this season doing it so far, Daniel and uh, Willis from Nashville. Yeah. So we will see. Daniel is at 84%. Willis is at 81.5. So they could be the first two guys to do it. More likely Daniel will be the first guy to do it. And Willis will fall off the pace because this is what tends to happen over long seasons. And, and by the way, as you know, we are both fans of expected goals as a concept, despite perhaps its flaws, it, it, the goals allowed below expected is, is very favorable for Daniel and was in, in Brazil as well. Uh, and the, that's, that's kind of a big deal. You know, that's the Matt Turner was a stellar in this statistic and it was a big, you know, part of the secret sauce of the New England revolutions uh, success during his time there. So, you know, Cruzeiro, great transaction. Daniel, we again, it's a small sample size because he was injured and we missed him for a while. But that looks like a pretty dang good transaction. Well, Decimo, he's on a minimum salary, by the way. And even though he's Canadian, he counts as a domestic on the U.S. roster because he's a homegrown to MLS. I think that's a pretty dang good minimum salary player. You know, if, for a guy who can cover uh, cover some time. So you're getting guys. You know, at a DP level swing, at a TAM level, at a minimum level, you get three different transactions that are all quite good. Jonathan Mensa, I think, has been very good this year, and he was signed basically under an emergency situation. So I think you've seen like very strong performance in the transfer market overall. And from the summer windows, you've seen good summer windows, although with the caveat, as I said, that this is a different kind of problem to solve this summer than they have in previous summers. What I would say, though, is that if you view the Quakes through the lens of what deals they have done, very strong work. If you view it through the lens of the deals that they haven't done, however, there are a little bit of questions to answer. Uh, and I don't know how much that is on Chris Leach. I actually suspect or I personally would put that more on ownership. And what I mean by that is we all knew before the season started that it was a little bit thin in attacking depth. You know, that the guys who were behind the top line starters, you know, there weren't that many of them that could be difference makers. And it re depended on some contributions from guys who either haven't been contributing or are very young and are kind of learning how to do so. Unfortunately, Benji Kikanovic has taken a step back. Useni Buda has you know, developed a little bit, but he hasn't really become a difference maker in his own right. Nico Chikiris has barely played. So the already acute you know, and foreseeable attacking depth situation has gotten even more acute. And mm -hmm. this was all foreseeable. And I know for a fact the front office was looking into those options at the beginning of this year before the season started. They didn't find anybody who fit the profile. Maybe that's a weakness in the front office's part. I suspect, however, that they were being held a little bit too tight by the budget because if your owner says, sure, I'm willing to sign off on a deal, but it has to be incredible value. The bar is so high, it's almost impossible to do a deal. This need that they had for attacking depth is so acute to me that it would have justified lowering the bar a little bit and saying, look, we just have to get kind of par market value. That's good enough because the need is so important. So to me, that is the one thing that I haven't liked about the business lately. And as I said, I don't necessarily hold that against the front office, but that is the big need going into the secondary window for me. Um, and I, I can expand on that a little bit longer, but I wanted to know if you agreed that that's kind of where it needs to be. Yeah, I, compl I completely agree. And particularly if Cade moves on, I, I think you really, because of the way that Lucci's style is and how he plays, you know, much more through the wingers, you've got to get that dynamic outside attacker. And if that's not Benji, uh, you know, if there's stuff they're seeing still in practice, it just isn't showing up on the pitch. Maybe you extend Benji and give him, give him some more time. 
But if it's not Benji and you're convinced it's not Benji, then you're going to have to take a pretty big swing with at least a TAM level, potentially DP level player to replace Kate. I think that would be priority one. And again, it, a lot of it depends on if Kate is moving or not. Can you stay with Cade, right? And, and patch that with Benji and Buddha and give some more opportunities to them to prove themselves between, you know, the window while, while Kate has gone at the gold cup. You can, I just think you risk your opportunity to have a home yeah. playoff spot when you're sitting right there at fifth, technically fourth with points per game. And, you know, my models say that the Quakes are likely to either end up in third and fourth, more so than fifth. So, you know, I would like to see them go for But that relies on them having... That relies on them having an expenditure, right? The second thing, and and talk to to us a little bit about Montero's uh, situation, because I'm not personally convinced that Montero is the long-term solution for the left side 810. I um, potentially agree with that, but let's put a pin in that until after okay. the the this thing. So, you know, we've been we've been focusing a lot on attacking depth and Cade for I think really good reason because to me the two biggest weaknesses in the team are the current state of production from the left wing position is not very good. Cade right. has been okay, but you know, but it's part not- of that goes with that left side eight ten too. I think that that's, that's true. That's that true. goes together. But that so that that's a weakness, and then the other weakness is the level of depth. Where especially if anybody's not available, you have Benji playing at kind of a middling level, and off the bench, you don't have a lot of options. And your biggest risks are an injury to Espinoza or an injury to Avobasiano. Oh, that yeah, and that would be a nightmare. That would be catastrophic. Right. Although I will, you know, the obligatory thing of me saying that I think Benji's a number nine in the long run, and they should play him more in that role. <laughs> and I think that Usini Buddha is more of a winger, one on one kind of take on guy. Uh, than as an up top guy, but Lucci actually quite likes him as a number nine. And I've heard, you know, from the staff that they, they like him as a number nine too. I have never coached soccer at any level, let alone a professional level. So clearly I'm missing something here. Um, but with those position switches aside, I think they might look a little bit better. Maybe it makes the problem a little bit less bad. Um, but y- when you have these two problems, if Cade's on the roster, you don't have your only option to fix the depth is to go get somebody in who's going to be comfortable being a secondary kind of role, a supporting role. So for me, the no brainer solution, and this is something I wrote about on the Quakes Up Center blog, is you go out and get a Latin American, likely Latin American U22 attacker, somebody who's a young guy, you know, who you can convince them, spend a couple of years here, develop, we'll sell you on to Europe. Latin America is just the best value for those types of players. You know, you're not going to get a good value on a European player at that level. Um, you know, if you're 19 years old in Europe and you have high upside, they're not letting you go. Um, whereas in Latin America, sometimes you can pry them, um, pry them out of those clubs. So that that's what you would do. You get some kind of attacker. I, I would lean towards a guy who focuses on the wings rather than a guy who focuses up top. Um, that's the that's what I would go do for the depth. But if Cade's still on the roster, that doesn't fix the problem of left wing production. So you're kind of stuck. Uh, and if you do go and get a DP to play in front of Cade, you might prevent your ability to sell him because he's not going to be playing as much and it might hurt his value. So you're kind of stuck until that happens. Once he leaves, however, then you absolutely can go out and get a DP left wing. And that, I think that is a great use of money. There's a lot of talent there. There's a lot of value for money at a left wing position. That is a position it makes sense to spend a whole lot of money in, especially in Lucci's system. Somebody who's more comfortable on the ball than Cade is, I think would take a lot of the pressure off some of the guys around him. Uh, you know, somebody can be like a real creator um, rather than Montero, who's uh, has virtues, but is not in his bones, a creator, really. You know, they, right. I think that if you imagine a guy who creates from a wide area like Nico Ladero, imagine that on the left side, you know, that's that's the ideal version of what you're putting in this place. So for me, you need two guys. Even if you go and get that DP, you still need another U22 guy to fill in the depth of that unit. Uh, so, you know, if Cade goes, you get two guys in in order to cover the bases. So do you have, do you have time for some patron questions? I do. Little, and, and well, and we shouldn't, the, one time. of the patron questions concerns Montero. So let's get to, to that when we get to it. Okay, we will. So let's start from the top here. Uh, Sam Havish says, has there been any official type statements regarding plans uh, for a timeline to adjust the various budget allocation methods we know and love? DP, TAM, GAM, homegrown, et cetera. I get the sense that the constellation of owner opinion looks like uh, to remove these handbrakes and uh, guardrails to whatever Fisher wants, presumably the status quo, or to maybe to a more 
measure and balance between the both of these. Basically, yeah. you know, do you favor or, or do you think ultimately we will end up in a situation where, hey, here's 25 million in, in salary cap, spend it how you want or an easing at least of the guardrails to get toward that. Direction. There's no doubt that in the long run, they are going to get rid of more and more of the guardrails and make it more and more flexible. Um, and that the overall spending cap, you know, meaning ca salary cap plus GAM plus TAM collectively is going to go up over time, probably less dramatically than it has over the last 10 years. Uh, but it is going to, both of those directions of travel are very clear. Uh, the one wrinkle is the CBA. So just remember if it has to do with player compensation, that means the league can't just unilaterally do stuff. They have to make sure they do it compliant with their CBA. And the CBA doesn't expire until 2027. So and the CBA says these things are going to exist. Exactly. So, and that's not to say that the players are going to want them to continue to exist. It just means that there, any changes will be subject to negotiation. Uh, and so therefore I would not expect major revolutionary changes until either not quite 2027, but, it could actually be right after the 2026 World Cup. The league expects to have a huge influx of interest. Maybe that's the time they kind of renegotiate the CBA and change the, these mechanisms. Uh, but I would say not for the next couple of years because of the CBA. Okay, good. Um, so there was a question from Trevor Wojcik about any progress on the county fairgrounds and the deal with the former Raiders facility. Any rumors on your end, Colin, in terms of the, uh, the walkthrough of John Fisher and some of the front office? on the Raider facility and or, you know, is that tied in some way, shape or form to the fairgrounds? I have heard nothing so far. I have not heard anything specifically about this other than just remind everybody that land deals like this and development is really hard. It has to go through a lot of hoops and, you know, the, it's not done until it's done. You know what I mean? Uh, so I, I think I don't have any specific reason to believe that it's not happening, uh, but it is going to be a difficult process. And, without putting too fine a point on it, it would not be out of character for John Fisher to visit a different location for a potential facility for one of his teams to put pressure on the first facility to give him a better deal. So you know, we see he's doing it with the A's. He might be doing it here with these facilities. And, you know, obviously the, I think the club would prefer it to be at the fairgrounds. It's much closer to where the stadium is, but you know, they're clearly he's not going to get jerked around uh, on a bad deal. So you know, if, if they can't get a deal done with the fairgrounds, they can't get it sorted because they remember they had a deal in place. You know, Dave Cavill announced a deal in place in 2015 or 16 uh, for a different academy facility that never came to fruition. So until they get this really done and dusted, I imagine they're going to explore all possible options, at least lightly. And also there's the time to build the facility. And yep. so I've hypothesized that they might be looking at the facility as a stopgap until the facility. Totally is possible. Not only the that, fact that it, the just, fact that it got leaked, the fact that it was publicized to me indicates that it might be part of a uh, leverage play. And also the uh, one thing to mention is it's not just the Quakes building a facility. The county does not have the infrastructure the facility will need. And there has to be time for the county yeah. not only to approve the infrastructure, which is what we're really waiting on right now, but then to actually go build the infrastructure. County government's not known for their efficiency, Colin. Um, it could take a little while. Uh, it seems to me there needs to be probably a potential two, three, even four year, uh, yeah. you know, plan in the meantime. Okay. So um, we got uh, several here from Brian. Um, just uh, any potential transfer rumors that you think the club might be looking at? Um, we talked about the possibility of DPs being bought down. Why don't we just go with the first question? You know, yeah. any potential transfer rumors that are swirling no, right now? I, 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 I don't know, but... I don't know about you. I mean, this front office and the and the staff and the the people that we talk to uh, are are very friendly, but they're my experience. This is not the kind of thing that they ever even remotely, you know, no. share. So they does very not. Tight. They're very very tight about uh, rumors. They do if get you, out. They do get out, and when they get out, they tend to get out toward national level. People, they tend to go to national level, but they also tend to come from agents more than the front office itself. Very, very good point. And you and I are not the kind of people to just dial up agents for rumors. Yeah, well, um, agents, agents have an agenda, so you can't necessarily trust them. It doesn't mean that they're wrong. Sometimes they do have the goods. It's just really hard to pick out who does and who doesn't. So we generally don't rely on agents. So if I had the five minutes with Chris Leach, first question would be a Rodriguez loan. Second one would yep. be Christian Espinosa's contract will be up at the end of the year. 
I, I believe that's accurate, but it's hard to tell. Yeah, it's always hard to tell. But, you know, if, if you were Leach, would you renegotiate it this season and try to get ahead of that? Uh, oh, yeah. Would you wait and see how he performs the second half of the season? He will be, in theory, from an age perspective, beginning the you know the the downhill part of his career potentially. Yeah. So, what type of deal would you bring him back on? Uh, my spreadsheet for some reason is not loading to show me his exact age. Um, let's see, Christian Espinosa will be twenty eight point three on August first, which is when I peg everybody's age to. Um, so yeah, I mean, look, if you, if you sign him to another three year deal, you're getting the last years, his like late prime as it were. And then, right. you know, once they cross 30 threshold, especially for attackers, you know, uh, not a lot of them, not a lot of them will last very long. It's not impossible, but th- there tends to be, you know, a decline after that. I absolutely would renegotiate right now and try to sign him. This question actually asks specifically. DP D- D- sign- D- 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 or Tim? absolutely DP. I think he is underpaid for his level of production right now uh, in a pretty dramatic sense. And I think that he could easily get this amount of money at a different MLS club or at at other clubs in say Mexico or in Argentina uh, or even, you know, European league. So no, 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 he's the, the value he's at right now. Absolutely. He is worth at least that. Uh, My sense is he loves San Jose. He wants to stay. That's my sense. Right. So I think that his if, if you were going to do a hard market value, he's underpaid, but he loves San Jose. I think the club loves him. And so I'm sure they'll come to an arrangement that's actually relatively team friendly. Uh, but there's no chance that he's going to take like a dramatic pay cut. Like that's not going to happen. OK. Uh, uh, Matt Richardson says, given Leach's pension for interleague signings, at least compared to Pirinelli, that's my commentary. Yep. Um, are there any MLS players either of you think would be realistic upgrades for us in the upcoming window? Anyone from Miami, Real Salt Lake has also been out there rumored to maybe be making players available due to uh, the moves that they're making. You know, any other clubs you think might sure. be uh, might have some targets? Well, look, any club who's bad uh, is going to be a potential seller. I will say for those domestic transactions, those usually there's less uh, in the way of the rumor mill. And one of the reasons that's true is in MLS, you can get traded without the agent, you know, facilitating the transaction because players can get traded without their consent. So international transfers have to have the agent involved. Therefore, they can be leaky. For domestic transfers, sometimes the agent isn't called until it's done and dusted. Uh, and so that it's much easier to keep the information tight. Um, and so I, I would say you generally get fewer rumors. There absolutely will be some selling clubs. I don't know. There's guys I like on both of those teams. I don't know if they fit the right profile or the right cost you know i i've always liked rubio rubin uh from rsl as a like a ferocious pressing forward um he doesn't have the most complete game uh but if that's appealing to lucci you know maybe that's a guy they cast off there's gonna be a bunch of guys like that uh so i I just i would be very hesitant to to predict which way they would go okay um curious in terms of a position of needs do you think left wing is the bigger hole we've kind of gotten to this a bit um, or do you need more depth that striker? Like if you could make the first move, where, where oh, would you left start? Left wing, left wing, left wing. And, and it's a very simple uh, reasoning, which is that the everybody else can adjust to, to fix the other issues. As I said, the, the coaching staff quite likes Susini Buddha as a number nine. I, I'm not as in love with it. And I obviously quite like Benji Kikanovic as a nine. So if they need to kind of shore up the depth at that position, they easily can. Uh, if they need to move Buddha over to the right, no problem. Easy enough. And actually, Cowell, to be honest, is probably more natural as a right winger than a left winger. Uh, left wing, if you bring in a DP left wing, all the things below it sort out very nicely. If you bring in a DP number nine, you're not really solving the left wing problem. And you're you know, kind of going, you're over indexing on the depth up, up top for me. So yeah, le- left wing kind of solves the other problems for me. Uh, Gilberto says, who is the likeliest player to get traded to facilitate an improvement in the team? Let me just try to like maybe round out the question a little bit, Colin. Like, who do you think would have the right level of value on the trade market to bring back, you know, some some gam or something like that with that would enable a trade up type transaction? Does anyone come to mind? (laughs) Not a lot, to be totally honest with you. The There's two guys who I, when I was reading this question, I think that are even possible, and I don't think either of them would be advisable, uh, is Benji Kikanovich and, and JT Marcinkowski. So these are these are local kids, and one of them's on a homegrown deal. You don't want to get rid of them, and they're on relatively 
cost effective salaries. But when you're talking about guys with a trade value, they need to be young. Uh, and they also need to be somebody that is not going to like dramatically hurt your on field performance. I can imagine a different MLS club saying a league average goalkeeper. That sounds great. You know, let's go get JT Marcinkowski. Oh, he's a domestic and a homegrown contract too. Even better. Uh, I could, and especially if they were a ball playing team that really wanted their keeper to play with his feet. I could also imagine a, a team in MLS saying, we saw what Benji could do last year when he was put into the right situation. We can get that out of him. He's just kind of a square peg in a round hole as a left winger in Lucci's system. So I think those are the two guys that have value, but I don't know if it would be enough to justify given that, you know, I think they're useful guys to have on the team and you're adding to the problems of depth. I, I think they should not be looking about exits other than Cade unless something, uh, unless a really big juicy offer comes in. Okay. Um, I actually think that potentially moving Montero, if you have the right replacement for him, like in the window, if you went out and got a DP into that spot, could you move Montero for value? I would put him on the list. If if you could, That's just here's here's no, no I, I agree with you. If somebody makes a nice offer for Jamiro Montero, then first of all, you get whatever they're offering in return, but then you also right. get his 1.2 million ish in salary off the books. That's a huge win. I don't think you get an offer. I think he has negative value on his contract, which is in the sports world, what we mean is a team would have to kind of be given extra resources to accommodate it. Um, yeah, the not quick by set much. Cover the salary or something. Yeah, like not by much. I, I don't think he, so, you know, if every player has a certain amount of on pitch value, they contribute. Christian Espinosa is contributing well in excess of his 1.2 million, you know, great deal. Uh, you know, Michael Baldissimo, not contributing nearly as much, but he's on a minimum salary. So he's contributing net positive value. I would say that Jimmy Montero is net negative, not by a huge amount, but it's either zero or net negative for 1.2 million. I don't think there'd be a lot of takers. And I certainly don't think there would be any big offers to take him off uh, right now. I think the better question with Montero is at the end of this season, Quakes have an option on his salary uh, to extend him. And I think that declining that option, taking back the DP slot and the salary is probably the most likely way the divorce happens between the two. And it's not because he's a bad player. It's just, you know, for a slot of that size, you know, they might be able to get a little bit more out of it. Yeah. And, and I think like you do need that creator option somewhere in the middle. So let's get into that a little bit more because, uh, you know, Montero maybe has more of a, a presence on both sides of the ball than, than Yule does. Um, I, th I think Andy's asking a little bit more of a tactical question here. Do we need two eights or can one be dropped in favor of an attacked mind minded central playmaker 10? Uh, between Jackson and Montero, is one of them less critical? And if so, are they candidates for interleague trades? I think the problem with this is Lucci's system currently, as I understand it and as I watch it, asks for two eights. Yeah. Um, it's not like it's a 4-3-3 three, three in the style of a 6 and 8 and a 10, kind of like we saw last year more um, you know, with Cavello. Um, it's it's actually more intended to work with double eights. And when they play out from the back, the, the one side always drops back and the other then positions themselves to be able to support more in the cent center of the pitch. Generally speaking, yep. it depends on the opponent and how they're pressing. So um, that double that eight it, concept, it, by the way, is, is, is becoming very hot across the world for tactically progressive managers. Um, but not, is the, not the traditional model of the Ajax or Barcelona style six, eight, ten, four, three, three. Right. Yeah. Yeah. The, the double eights is becoming hot. The double eights is, is is kind of the thing, and and it's one that I see all through, like youth soccer as well. Yep. Um. So with that in mind, do does does the middle need more production, or if you got enough production out of the wings, if you had another Espinoza on the left side? Does, does this conversation kind of become moot because you get the production out of the wingers, which is really, I think, what what uh, Lucci's looking for in the system? Yeah, I mean, uh, you, you've heard me talk for the last 45 plus minutes or so about, <laughs> about this. That's the case. And, and we've been you know in touch over the months. Yeah, the way the system is set up is that those two midfield eights are pressing, they're retaining the ball, they're, you know, they're, they're, contributing and, and building from a deeper kind of role. Neither of them are designed to be, you know, penetrating into the box uh, and really like attacking zone 14 and, and into the box itself. 
Uh, that's not the way the system's designed. Obviously, occasionally they'll find opportunities to do so. So I actually think Jamiro Montero is a pretty good tactical fit for that type of role. Uh, he and Yule are both really good fits. I think Yule is less replaceable because of his passing vision and range um, than than Montero is. But you know, th th those are both kind of good tactical fits. The problem is Montero's t weaknesses are magnified if you don't have a guy who can create at the left wing. And we have not seen someone like Espinosa. As I said, the platonic ideal is somebody like Nico Ladero, uh, who, who in his prime was running very hard and creating from a winger position. You know, that's if you have a guy who can possess the ball on the wing, if you have a guy who can, you know, really create and penetrate, that takes a lot of pressure off of Montero to do that type of work. Uh, and I think that it will kind of keep him more focused on the things he's best at. Um, so I do think that it solves a lot of the problems. And I, I think that the late game stuff that's been troublesome lately is that they just haven't really been able to possess the ball uh, at all. Like they've just given up trying to possess the ball. Some of that is going to be a tactical issue. Some of that is the depth issue where they just don't have any depth in the positions that might be able to hold on to it. But if you have a guy, you know, you notice in those situations where they get relief is when they release Christian Espinosa and he hangs on to it effectively and, you know, progresses the ball upfield. You know, imagine that they had somebody, maybe not at Christian's level, but, you know, something more similar to that. So, yeah, I, I think the left wing has a big burden of creation that Chase, uh, that I was, I almost said, I almost said Chance Cowell. I almost said Kate Cowell. <laughs> I think I went with Chase Cowell there. Um, no, they, they, if they have that, I think that makes, I think that really makes up for the limitations of Montero. Montero, as a, you know, no, as a high energy number eight, is he worth $1.2, $1.3 million a year? Maybe not. Um, but he is a very useful player in that role uh, if he's kind of if we're not relying on him to do that penetration. And I should also say, by the way, his defensive stats are down uh, on, you know, his peak Philly years. You know, he's getting in. I think I don't know if he's 30 yet, but it does seem like there's a little bit of uh, right. action related decline. Sometimes that's purely tactical, but it does seem like there's been a decline in overall defensive activity. Yeah, I think you're you're in this catch 22 with, with Kate. You you. You have to play him because you have to showcase yep. him. You got to hope that he performs because you want to be able to move him. He wants to be able to move at some point here. And the best, the best of all the worlds is that Kate Cowell, you know, really turns on the afterburners in the second part of the season, or does it at the Gold Cup and just begs everyone to in Europe to uh, to come take a chance on. Yep. Um, one more thing, a last question from Esteban here: Did MLS fully switch to all charter flights? Um, it was started during the pandemic. Uh, was has there been any rumor about it being rolled back to the uh, CBA minimums? It seems like the charter flights are still on. I have not seen any rumor or anything one way or the other on this. Colin, do you have any information? Nope, I have the same impression you do. Okay, um, yeah, no way Messi goes on a regular flight ever. Um, <laughs> Yeah. yeah, probably not. Well, so so uh, the, the you know obviously the, the minimums were exactly that they were a minimum, and so then it would yep. be you know if they decided to to roll back to the CBA, every owner would still have at their discretion the ability to fly as many charter flights as they chose, and so you could certainly imagine a situation in which no one's going to ask Messi to fly domestic travel, and yep. he would for sure you know be make sure that everyone. Inter Miami is flying on charter flights uh, for all uh, four years or so of his contract. Okay. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, another comment from Crystal here actually, some teams are not doing as much charter as we are. So maybe a bit of a splurge from John Fisher, who's not known for splurges. Um, no, he's not. But, uh, but it looks like uh, the Quakes are uh, maybe getting more benefit from that than other MLS teams. Colin, anything we didn't get a chance to cover that you want to cover? Yeah, actually, uh, and very much on the note that you just discussed, I, I think that, I mean, I said earlier in the show, I think that the ownership has, you know, I, I work in the investment industry, you know, there's, it, 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 your investment committee has to kind of calibrate how how strict it's going to be about its, you know, risk return trade off. Um, and what I think is, I think that that strictness has been far too high uh, recently, because it's, it, which is good, because it means on one sense, which is it means they've gotten really good value deals for the most part. Uh, but the problem is, it means that if you have urgent things that need to be fixed, it's really hard to fit it into that threshold. Um, you know, and the best management and the best owners are able to kind of calibrate 
when you need to be seeking pure value and when you need to be able to loosen it up a little bit to kind of get the guys you need to get. Um, so I think that that's an adjustment that needs to happen. But the thing that I want to note is my long range uh, theory about John Fisher is that he's not categorically unwilling to spend money. Uh, he certainly spent a bunch of money on Matias Almeida. He made him the highest page coach in the league. Uh, and he gave him in the early windows a pretty big signings in a bunch of different ways. I think and all the he, staff. And all the staff. And yeah, so there was spending there. Uh, and I think that what it is, and I've said this before, if you don't have faith in the guys who are making the decisions about the spending, you're not going to give them more money. You know, if I give you a million dollars to invest and you get me an Andy Rios, I'm not inclined to give you another million dollars. Um, so, you know, Leach and company were given, you know, a certain kind of baseline level of spending before they could prove themselves. So they had to kind of prove themselves with their initial outlay. But the other thing is it doesn't necessarily make sense to be hyper aggressive in spending in the early stages of a rebuild. Now that they've kind of reached that second stage of like, we've gone through the horrible times and kind of accumulated some talent to get the roster up to kind of at least a respectable level. Now there's a possibility that Fisher changes tack and says, look, this team has a realistic chance of making the playoffs. I have a lot of faith in the decision makers. That could be where the pivot happens. So what, this will be a test of my theory. Uh, if my theory is correct, it means that the, the floodgates are not going to completely open, but they might loosen up a little bit uh, about what their threshold is. Uh, and I think that would be a very welcome development given how urgent the needs are. You know, they've, they've managed to get to where they are on the table and they've managed to do what they've been able to do with almost nothing wrong happening. Like they've had very good luck so far. They have good luck on XG, actually, you know, right now. Uh, they have good luck for injuries. If anything goes wrong, you know, they could easily tumble out of the playoff spots. So I think that they really do need to invest in shore up. I think they know that and we'll find out in early July, uh, well, through the month of July, uh, whenever they do this deal, whether or not that ownership agrees. Yeah, and, and one more, you know, positive thing there is Jared Charlie in an interview with Goal.com indicated that they are looking to increase the budget year over year during Lucci's tenure. So uh, we should see what you're saying, Colin. Um, you know, so long as that faith stays in place in the decision makers, we should see an increase in expenditure. Will we see it in the secondary transfer window? Well, we're about to find out. And uh, I, I'd be know, stunned. I'll make a prediction. Of I... Cal's the, other, the other thing we got to be watching here. I can't predict K Tal, but I would be stunned if they did not add net players in the attack uh, through this window. I think it would be um, a, a huge mistake, and I don't think, and I think that they intend on it. Yeah, and to me, the the big the big change here to your point about playoffs and and okay, they're in the playoffs. Like, how do they get that better, you know, home advantage, like playoff type position? In order to do that, the moves need to come earlier in the window. Last year, Correct. because they were doing it more to build the roster for this year, they could make them late in the window because they weren't trying to add immediately on. They weren't going to change the fortunes of the 2021 team um, by adding earlier in the window. And while we all can complain about it and rightfully so, you know, I think those complaints are all valid that somewhat 2022 was a throwaway season. Um, now we're seeing in 2023, the benefits of the patients. But to your point, if you want to make a move this season, those deals need to move earlier in the window. And if you're looking to get GAM from a K transaction, that means K Cowell, you know, needs to also be moving earlier in the window, which means there's a chance that uh, this weekend's game could be the last time maybe that we see K Cowell yeah. in an Earthquakes uniform before such a deal would happen. That would be quite interesting. And by the way, well, moving, Colin, back, moving back to one thing that we said earlier about, you yeah. know, why last summer's window is different than ours now is not, is the playoffs thing you just mentioned is earlier means better for the results, which matter unlike last year. But remember late in the window is where the best deals are to be had. Uh, right. you know, so, so they're going to have to make these trade-offs. They're going to have to accept a deal that is not the ideal deal if they want to get guys in the door fast enough to make a difference on their playoff push. Maybe one of those, like, you know, just getting for value type moves earlier in the window, like get some depth now and then like upside, maybe look for that, like, you know, bigger transaction, one that can really have that impact, you know, next season, maybe with a little bit of playoff potential as well you could do a little bit later in the window so i'm okay. excited well this has been uh always good always enlightening to talk with you colin always learn something 
a little bit new. Um, and uh, I'm sure everyone's very excited to see you. And, uh, you know, best wishes for everything now that you're back in the great state of New York. Much appreciated. Nice to see you as well. Good luck in the window, everybody. It'll be fun. All right. We're out. Thanks. Take care, everyone. We will see you for the Aftershock um, after uh, the Portland match on Saturday. Take care.